Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're joined by Rick Rosso, who's come down to us from the East Bay. Uh, Rick uh, got his BS from uh, the University of Florida in chemistry and uh, PhD from the University of Indiana, uh, both in chemistry. And uh, very soon thereafter, he moved to uh, the West Coast and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where he's been working uh, for the best part of three decades now. He's the founder and scientific director of the Laser Material Interactions Group there, uh, where they work on uh, such topics as uh, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, scanning optical microscopy, and uh, standoff uh, laser ultrasonic sensors. He has uh, sponsored 12, or he has uh, supervised 12 PhD students uh, with three more uh, currently at, the, uh, at his group. He's also the founder and president of Applied Spectra Incorporated. Uh, and uh, that, that company works on uh, LIBS and uh, inductive coupled mass spectroscopy, laser absorption, inductive coupled mass spectroscopy, and Raman and fluorescence techniques. Today he's going to talk to us uh, about that topic and specifically uh, laser plasma spectrochemistry uh, and its applications uh, uh, to uh, space science and defense and so on. So if you'll join me in welcoming Rick. Okay, I guess you can hear me. Uh, thanks very much, for Adrian, for the uh, invitation. That's the first time I, I've heard someone said I've been at Berkeley for three decades. Ouch. Uh, <laughs> wow, that hurt. <laughs> anyway, 29 years, not 30. So, um, but still having, actually having more fun now than I ever have. So, um, my normal way of giving a talk is very informal. I tuck my shirt in just for you guys. Um, so if you have questions, if you like what I say, you don't understand what I say, you don't like what I say, throw something at me, say something, raise your hand. I'd much rather, you know, talk about something you're interested in or don't understand than just get, get, stand up here and give a monologue. So with that, um, you know, feel free to chime in any time. So like Adrian said, um, I was telling him before the seminar, I have been funded by the Department of Energy predominantly, it's in my entire career at, at uh, Berkeley, to uh, blow things up with laser beams. That's pretty much a kid's dream, right? Make a career out of that. I was enamored by lasers as an undergraduate student and I made a career of it, so here it goes. So um, I start off, uh, at a, I gave a, a talk in Spain a couple months ago and it was a, a, a plasma spectrochemistry conference where we have looked at different sources to do analytical chemistry for, you know, throughout the history of analytical spectroscopy. And we always try to come up with a source that allows us to excite the mass to excitation, look at the emission, and that's how we do spectroscopy. We've t we heard about sparks, arcs, um, microwave plasma, glow discharges, so I look at this as this is a modern day source. It's a laser induced plasma. If I take a laser beam and I hit and I have a pulse laser beam, it has to be pulse because you have to have a lot of peak power. And I hit anything, I don't care what it is. I will remove some of the mass. I'll create a little spark. That's our laser plasma. And I'll also um, eject or create a lot of little particles. So I'll talk to you a little bit about how we use the, well, most of what I'll talk about today is this plasma. Most of you have heard laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy LIBS. I know Jen gave a talk on that a while back. Um, I, I tend to look at it a little bit more generically than, laser, than LIBS because I don't know what breakdown means. So I call it laser plasma spectroscopy. The community has labeled it LIBS, but I like to go further <clears throat> and talk more about the fundamentals and all the capabilities. So I pose the question, is this possible? Is there such a source where we could do elemental, molecular, and isotopic analysis with submicron spatial resolution and at a distance? So 
So I challenge you to name any other source, an analytical atomic spectroscopy, other than a star maybe, but that's, you're, you have to tell me more about that than I know. But from what I know from the sources we have at atomic spectroscopy, there's no other source that will allow you to do all of this. And so let me show you some of um, <clears throat> how, we, how we do some of these applications and, and what this means. So a little bit of background. Okay, first thing is what is laser ablation? Um, because that's the term that we have studied. Actually, it's, it's a mechanism that comes from NASA of all places, a blade of cooling as, um, to, to dissipate energy or heat by removing mass. It's a term we have given to this laser material interaction process. Most of my funding proposals say laser material interactions. We don't even try to define a mechanism because we really don't know the mechanism. What happens when a laser beam hits? I showed you this already. Um, all kinds of examples, um, things we've studied over the years, just to, just to start things off from fun. This is a LASIK process, in case you don't know that. When a laser hits your eye, that's an image of what happens when the laser hits and removes part of your cornea. Little, little explosion, okay? Um, nuclear explosion. <laughs> I, are you guys reading lunch? I'm not. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Um, so, we try to model the fundamental mechanisms. What's the physics and chemistry of that energy hitting that surface, creating that explosion? And many of the mechanisms that we can attribute to this plasma have also been attributed to an atomic energy blast. A delta function of energy delivered in a very short time, what happens? And this is just a little uh, image of a laser coming in here. There's a solid target here. And this is just a little temperature, a time. Um, Time display of the temperature of the formation of the plasma. I'll talk more about that as we go on. So that just sort of sets the stage for what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so it starts with laser ablation. So there's two primary techniques that the analytical community uses to study laser ablation or to benefit from laser ablation. We start with a laser. We, we blow something up. And then there's a, for, uh, there's a sequence of mechanisms, and I probably should have showed some other slide maybe with some, with some images, but I'll, I'll go into this some later. Um, you have this plasma formation process. Well, first of all, you get all these electrons that start coming off the surface. The electrons collide with the, um, with the atmosphere. Um, you get collisions, then the ions, atoms come off the surface, and then you have cooling in that plasma. We study the mechanisms there because we want to do LIBS. We want to look at the light, spectrally resolve it, and tell us what was in that sample. The other thing that happens is when that plasma cools, it forms nanoparticles. And that was one of the first ways that buckyballs were, were created. You can ablate carbon, graphite, and you can form the C60 particles in these laser plumes. You can form all kinds of materials in these laser plumes. We've done this for years. Um, the other thing that happens is this exfoliation process, this dissipation of energy through the ejection of mass. So if you're looking at the particles, you go into an ICP mass spectrometer, inductively coupled plasma. So this is a secondary source that would be doing your, either your mass spec or you can put your ICP in front of an emission spectro spectrometer. So these are the two primary ways of doing analytical chemistry based on doing laser ablation. And we use both nanosecond and femtosecond laser pulses. OK so far? OK. So just to give you a little bit about the physics, and I won't go too much into this. I hope you guys don't mind that I'm facing this way. I don't know if that means I'm right-brained or left-brained, or have no brain. I don't know. Been at Berkeley three decades. It'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll do it to you. <laughs> OK. So. Um, a little bit about the time domain, which I think is kind of neat because you guys can tell me the type of stuff you study. Um, we look at the from when the laser, from when a material absorbs the laser photons to when we see particles. We have about 15 orders of magnitude in time. So a lot of different mechanisms go on over that, over that time period. <clears throat> This is just a little cartoon the students did where you have a laser pulse coming in from this side. This is a target. So that's a, a femtosecond laser. That's a nanosecond laser. A uh, femtosecond laser is a delta function of energy and time. A nanosecond laser actually has some uh, equivalent distance. 
So and the reason why we do, we, we study this effect or we use femtosecond and nanosecond laser ablation is because we get entirely different mechanisms, we get entirely different plasma temperatures, we get different sized particles. And if you notice one more time when it starts, the femtosecond laser will come in, represented by that little air, here we go. Femtosecond laser departs its energy, everything starts happening after the pulse. The nanosecond laser is still on while your surface is ejecting atoms or electrons. So you have an interaction with the stuff coming off the surface with the laser pulse. So you'll get entirely different type of processes because of that. Okay, so we, we look at the different mechanisms, whether or not it's the heat affected zone, the size of the particles, the shock wave, because when you hit something with a laser beam, you hear it. So I've heard people who had LASIK said they hear it. I've never had LASIK. I won't let a doctor touch me with a laser. <laughs> <laughs> I was a consultant for a company that did prostate surgery with lasers. Oh my God. <laughs> oh. And I just went, <laughs> is, are you still eating? <laughs> I just went to a laser medical conference in, in Cairo. Oh my God. Okay. It's, there's, there's, it's good. So the laser-induced plasma, or LIBS, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, we're mostly going to concentrate on that in this talk. I'm going to talk about doing analytical chemistry with the plasma, not by collecting the particles, okay? If you collect the particles and go into an ICP MS, then you can do a lot higher sensitivity because most of the mass that comes off from the ablation is particles. Not, a lot of energy does not go into exciting that plasma. It goes into the formation of plasmas or this spallation process. <clears throat> Just a little photograph, I told you there's a big difference between a femtosecond and a nanosecond induced LIBS plasma. This is a target right here, laser came in, hit the target, this is just a photograph. So we had the same energy of the laser, the same wavelength, the same spot size, the same sample. The only thing that was different is the pulse duration. The femtosecond was 100, 100 femtoseconds and the nanosecond laser was about 4 nanoseconds pulse duration. So because like I told you that nanosecond laser actually will heat that plasma. So you can see it's a much different type of plasma. The time relaxation process, cooling processes, everything is different. Here, I, I, need to keep, I need to tell you which way the laser is coming in. This little setup just shows you it's very simple to set this up. It's very hard to get good analytical chemistry. That's what we spend 30 years being able to do. Laser comes in, hits the surface, goes through a little dichroic mirror. You have a little ICCD or CCD up there, and then you do your spectroscopy. Here's some just plasma temperature images from one nanosecond out to 30 nanoseconds after a laser hit. Uh, again, you can just look at the color, color map, give you an idea of temperature. But from an analytical point of view, this is the intensity versus wavelength. And maybe this, uh, Alex can probably tell us what line that is. It, is it silicon line, Alex, at 260 or 280? I can't see it, 260. I think it's a silicon or a copper line. Okay, it's an elemental transition, okay? But what this represents is some element emitting, you know, fireworks in the sky, they're all elements emitting. Um, but at first, 10 nanoseconds after a laser, everything is white light. That's the white light you see. Our eyes can't spectrally resolve the, the different, the colors in that plasma, but the spectrometer can. But as that temperature, that plasma cools and the electron number density um, reduces, you'll see the plasma basically, well, the spectrometer can see time resolved and pick out you know, when the elements are emitting, whether or not they're atomic transitions or ionic transitions, or I'll show you what we're doing now with molecular transitions. So this is the basis of LIBS, laser-induced plasma spectrochemistry. Look at where this emission line occurs and the intensity that tells you what, it, what is the element that's emitting and how much. Okay, that's the analytical chemistry. Calibrate it to known standards and you can do quantitative analysis. Okay, so this is the traditional way that LIBS has been used. Um, you know, you have a um, broadband spectra, in this case it's not very broadband, it's, it's in the UV, it's from 390 nanometers to 420. And we happen to be looking for lead in this little toy truck. This is something we did for the Consumer Protection Agency. So um, we take a little toy off the shelf of Toys R Us, which you can't do anymore because they've all been taken, taken back. And we look for this one particular transition where we know lead emits a very strong signal. All right? 
So we tune our spectrometer. We did a calibration plot with some standards for this particular yellow paint. And we basically go in there, you hit it with one laser shot, you measure the intensity, fit it on your analytical curve, and you say how much lead was in that toy. That's as simple as it is, okay? So that's elemental quantitative analysis. Here's something else you can do. You can look at it. This is um, mapping of a surface as well as into the surface. This happens to be a um, oak elemental analysis. I had to scrub some of these because they come from some of our customers. Okay, this is a SIGS film. This is a solar material, copper, indium, gallium, selenide um, material. And they just wanted to see the homogeneity across the surface of this solar um, material and into the depth. So here we're looking at things like aluminum, gallium, indium, titanium, moly. And again, this is a function of depth as a function and versus on the surface. So you can do surface mapping, you can do depth profiling. Strictly elemental analysis without any sample preparation. So that's the beauty of this, without touching it, without using any consumables, without digesting the sample, hitting with a laser beam and looking to see what the chemistry. Just another application where we were also doing lead, I think in this case, this is for some lead frames for the semiconductor industry. Again, the same lead line. And we want, this is um, a regulation of hazardous substances, uh, uh, something with Asia and, and Europe where they um, trying to regulate how much lead goes into the electronic components because of e-waste. So, and this is again, another SIGS film where we're looking at sodium impurities across the surface. So this is just um, the laser spot hit different, spot, uh, different regions across the top of this uh, SIGS film. And we were looking at, um, oh, I'm sorry, we, we dug into the, um, the CAD sulfide, the SIGS layer itself. And they wanted to see what was the sodium impurity. So you can look at impurity distributions in materials. And I'll talk about the different spot sizes. What is the spatial scale? Remember in our, um, and the first question, can we do all this? Is it, can we do this at the submicron spatial resolution? So I'll show you some of the work. Uh, depth profiling, this is just kind of a silly picture. Um, again, when you have a, a thin layer stack for some kind of a semiconductor circuit or a solar film, you can look at the analytical chemistry. Most people are familiar with secondary ion mass spec. You stick the um, sample in a vacuum chamber. We don't have to do this in a vacuum chamber. Uh, we can do this at atmospheric pressure, but again, you can look at all the different elements as you go through these different layers. And we're working on getting nanometer, tens of nanometer type depth resolution. And we're also working on getting nanometer spatial resolution. Okay, so something we started doing just um, maybe two years ago now, Alex. I should introduce Alex's actually came to Berkeley as a visiting scientist many years ago, and now he's working at the company as a scientist. So, and he actually is involved with a NASA SBIR that the company has. So Alex has been telling us that we need to be doing isotopes for a long time, because we, we mostly emphasized elemental analysis. And the reason is, these laser plasmas aren't very good for doing isotopes. You saw that very broadening of the lines. Well, let me show you some. Let me, let me give you some background first. Isotope shifts. This is fundamental. It doesn't matter what source you're in. If you have no broadening of your spectral lines, this is isotope shift on the order of wave numbers. Uh, and you can convert wave numbers into nanometers or picometers. Wave number depends on what wavelength region you're at. One wave number is about 25 picometers at 500 nanometers, okay? So these are the different elements on the periodic chart, whether or not you have hydrogen, helium, whatever, zirconium, cat, uh, gadolinium, all the elements. And this comes from the um, laser isotope separation program at Livermore. So it's one of their publications where they're looking at what are the, the atomic, what are the shifts in an atomic transition due to stark, stark broadening uh, that you would see for the different elements, okay? And you can see they're not very big. Uh, most shifts are on the order of, you know, a few picometers at best. I don't know if you know a lot about, well, of course you guys know a lot about spectrometers, but getting picometer spectral resolution takes a very large spectrometer. And if your spectral lines are broadened, then, you, you know, your spectral lines can be broadened to a larger degree than the shift itself, 
right? If the shift's only a picometer and you have a high electron number density or high temperature, you're not going to ever see that, 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 that resolution. So let me just give you an example of what people have been able to do with ICP OES. This is where they actually sent samples into the inductively coupled plasma and looked at the emission spectroscopy. OES is optical emission spectroscopy. Some people say atomic emission spectroscopy, AES. But anyway, this source, this is a plasma, and it runs at a much different temperature and electron number density than a laser plasma. But people have been able to see the uranium uh, 235, 236, 238 isotopic shifts. And this is actually one of the largest shifts, uh, especially for a heavy element. If we go back to this slide, uranium's out here. So you can see gadolinium, samarium, some of the rare earths have a little bit bigger, but that's not a big scale. So, and then obviously your helium and some of your, you know, lithium and things like that and boron, they'll have bigger shifts. But uranium is considered one of the largest isotope shifts for the 235, 238, and of course the government's very interested in that for non-proliferation um, issues. But you can resolve this shift in an ICP OES if you have the right spectrometer. You have enough spe spectral resolution to see the 25 picometers. And when I was talking about lines being broadened, as the temperature increases or the electron number density increases, these lines will broaden, okay, due to stark broadening, do, well, not Doppler, but mostly stark collisional broadening. But this line width will become larger than that shift, especially in a laser plasma, because in a laser plasma, the electron number density can be orders of magnitude higher than in an ICP. So we haven't even looked at isotopes in these laser plasmas because of the, this reason. The shifts are very small and the lines are usually broadened. Okay, and this is just, this is just some other work where someone did the, um, oh, actually this is where uranium, so Los Alamos did some work back in the early 90s where they did show you could do um, isotopes in these laser plasmas, but you had to reduce the pressure or you had to have a reduced pressure and an inert environment because you could not you had to cool the plasma and you could not have collisions, right? You had to get the electron number density down, but at this low pressure, um, this is a laser they use, they were able to see, and this is obviously highly enriched uranium, 235, 238, they were able to see the ratio of 235 to 238 in this highly enriched uranium. This is actually from France, but very similar to what the Los Alamos group did. So this is some of the first work where people did show you could do isotope analysis in a Libs plasma. Okay, but it had to be in a special chamber with reduced pressure. This is the Los Alamos work. Now remember, uranium has a, two, a 25 picometer shift. Plutonium only has about a 12 picometer shift. And I know you guys aren't interested in uranium and plutonium, but if you come from Los Alamos and live more in my DOE world, these are the, these are the elements you're interested in. Um, again, they had to go to 100 millitor helium environment in order to see the plutonium splitting for the uh, 239, I think, yeah, 239, 240, okay? But we want to do LIBS without having to put a sample in a vacuum chamber. So how are you going to do isotopes without a vacuum? So this is something we ignored for a long time in LIBS plasmas. When these plasmas form in an atmosphere, and you rip everything off, you heat everything to where it's, you know, elemental, hot elemental species, you know, strontium, cerium, whatever is in this plasma, and then it's in an oxygen environment, it collides, it, cl it collides with the oxygen, and as that plasma cools, it forms an oxide. So these spectra we've ignored for years because, I don't know, you look at that, it looks like noise, it looks like garbage. Well, the old uh, cliche, one man garbage is another man gold, something like that. This is all vibrational rotational states of the molecule. So we were ignoring it for all these years, but there's tremendous information in these spectra. Okay, so here's, um, this is um, OD and OH. This is ablating strontium fluoride, looking at strontium, I think it's strontium oxide emission. I think that's a mistake because it's the same wavelength region here. But these are, um, like I said, molecular oxide bands in the laser plasma at atmospheric pressure with a single laser pulse. Okay, so how does this relate to isotopes? Okay, so an atomic transition from a ground state to an excited state, right, you have very small shifting of the excited state due to stark 
um, due to uh, mass differences of your, of your element, so you'll get very small shifting in your isotope splitting, or you get very, very small isotope splitting. That's what I talked about earlier with that chart from Livermore. Okay, so for boron, this, um, for the boron 10, boron 11, I think this is, on, well, see, I'm going to go back and forth between wave numbers and, um, and wave length, so I apologize for that. I should try to be, be more consistent. Anyway, 0.33 um, uh, wave numbers, I think, is only on the order of a couple picometers. And we'll, we'll see something different on some other slide. Very small, right? This is 208.889, wavelength 208.891. So there's 10 picometers, uh, no, 3 picometers, 2 picometers. I can't count. I need a calculator. <laughs> so 89 to 91 uh, picometer uh, distance between the boron 10, boron 11, if you were looking at atomic transitions, which is what we traditionally did in Libs plasmas. However, if you look at the, uh, the energy levels for a, a molecular oxide, you know, you have both the, uh, you have the reduced mass, right, which gives you this sort of a distance thing where are the two atoms when they're vibrating. Then you have all the vibrational states, and on top of the vibrational states, you have rotational states. So here's the boron 10, boron 11 splitting in boron oxide. And it's on the order of 113 wave numbers, which is somewhere around 700 picometers compared to a couple picometers. So this is why this is how we're going to start doing um, isotopic analysis in these Libs plasmas. Now we're going to look at the molecular spectra instead of the atomic. So again, a little bit back to the fundamentals of the Libs plasma. This is uh, when the laser hits at versus time as that plasma expands and cools. You basically, there'll be boron emission from the ions, which we know the ions emit immediately after the laser pulse. The atoms last a little bit longer. Uh, that should be the red. The ion intensity drops off sooner because of uh, collisions. The atomic transitions will last a little bit longer, and this is only on a microsecond time scale. But after those atoms start colliding with the atmosphere, you start forming the molecular oxides, so later in time. So if you look later in time in these Libs plasmas, you'll see the molecular spectra, not the atomic spectra. Okay? And it's the molecular spectra that's going to allow us to do isotopes. Okay, so I could add or subtract. It's 2.5 picometers. So in order to see this boron atomic isotope splitting, boron 1011, you would need very low plasma and you would need a, a, a very low pressure and a very high resolving power monochromator. We're looking at the boron 10, boron 11 splitting at atmospheric pressure um, with a very low resolving monochromator. So here you're going from 208.95 to 208.96. Um, we're going from 254 to 262 nanometers. So that's what, um, 8,000 picometers? So you can easily see this. And again, this is not noise. This represents all the vibrational rotational characteristics of that molecule. Okay. We can actually calculate what the spectra should look like, and we can fit that using fitting parameters to calculate what the uh, isotope ratio is. And you can see, even though our model is not perfect, we don't fit the spectra perfectly, we do calculate the right abundance ratio. We calculate that the boron 10 abundance ratio is about 20.24. And if you look in the literature, you see it's anywhere from about 18.9 to 20.3. So for a one single laser shot, the fact that we can do this at atmospheric pressure, no sample preparation, just immediately get the measurement, that's pretty spectacular. And it's kind of cool, too, because if you do spread things out, and again, this is very low resolution, if you do spread things out, you can see regions in the spectrum where one isotope should emit and the other isotope should not. So you can think about how you can make a, um, a system with very fine-tuned um, wavelength filters to only look at one isotope or another and do your um, isotope ratios that way. Um, different boron isotope concentrations. We, we made anywhere from pure boron 10 up to pure boron 11. And again, this looks like hash. But you fit this, you know, you generate a database, you fit these spectra with a principal component analysis, and we're able to do the quantitative analysis of the um, isotope ratio. So that's a pretty darn good curve. Again, no sample preparation, hit it with a single laser beam, 
and we can tell you what the isotope concentration is. So we did a bunch of other, um, we, like I said, I get paid all my career to blast things with a laser. So of course, what do you do? You start blasting everything with a laser again. Um, we, we're doing cop, uh, carbon, carbon 13, carbon 12, oxygen. Again, this is what the spectra look like. In the laser plasma, these are not highly resolved. This is highly resolved. This is very low resolution. A lot of this is within the last couple months. We're just starting to process a lot of these data. Um, this is OH versus OD. And again, these are measured in the laser plasma. You can see how the isotope, different, isotope difference gives you a different spectra. And again, this is simulated, but you can see regions where you can definitely see one isotope from the other one. So that's uh, for both the oxygen and deuterium hydrogen system. This is what we're really spending a lot of our time on right now, other than the, the DOE stuff that I probably can't talk about. Uh, strontium, 86, 87. You cannot, no way can you do a strontium isotope looking at an atomic transition. The atomic transition is less than one picometer shift. So the atomic, the, the, but for the, um, the 86, 88 strontium, we get, depending on what band we're looking at, um, this is, this is the, the A1 to X1 band. Again, that has to do with what excited state versus what ground state, what, what uh, vibrational levels. Depending on what wavelength region, we can see anywhere from about 100 to, and up in terms of the, um, the isotope splitting. So these are measured data. You can see the strontium 86, 88. Uh, no other way to do this without being in a vacuum and without doing something like a very, very high accelerator mass spec or something like that. So it's pretty cool, one laser shot. Again, we're spending a lot of time on strontium. We have models to predict what the spectra should look like. We're doing the calculations for all of the strontium isotopes. And again, you should be able to see pretty good shifts. Uh, depending, again, I talked about depending on what vibrational band head we're at. This is a 825 to 830 nanometers. There should be about 145 picometer shift between the uh, 86 and 88. And then again, if you're at a different vibrational transition or, or, or electronic vibrational transition, you would get a different isotope shift. But again, the, for strontium itself, it's less than one picometer. So atmospheric pressure, you, we can do isotopes now. So I know I'm beating heck out of that. But this is sort of the summary slide. We did a calculation. This is, these data are the same as that one I showed you from the, uh, the Livermore program, where they, we just transposed their data onto our curve, and we, instead of calling it mass number, we actually listed the elements. And again, we plotted the, wave, the shifts and wave numbers, because again, just like that strontium, it depends on where you are, what the shift will be. But these are, this is a log scale. This is what we calculate when you're looking at the oxide or the fluoride that forms in these plasmas versus what Livermore said that according to theory you should see from atomic transitions. So this opens up a whole new realm of doing isotopes now with Lib's plasmas. Several orders of magnitude, especially for the lighter elements. Okay, enough about isotopes. I think I beat the heck out of that. So the other question is, can we do all this good stuff at a distance? No wait, nope, I'm going ahead of myself. Can we do it at submicron spatial resolution? Okay. Most of the time, when you focus a laser beam down, you focus it. If you're really lucky and you work hard, you can focus it to about half the wavelength. Okay. Most of the time, when people do libs, they're working with greater than 100 micron spot size. Well, I want to look inside grain boundaries. I want to look at um, tiny little things. I want to look at nanoparticles that people are making. So, how do I get? How do I do this kind of chemistry? of a nanoparticle, something that's 100 nanometers or 10 nanometers. I can't focus my laser beam down, if, like I said, less than half the wavelength. So there's a whole field of science called near-field optics. If I take and I, and I have a fiber, and I, and I constrict, and if I draw the fiber down to tens of nanometers, hundreds of nanometers, and I send a laser beam through that fiber, and I place that fiber within the near field, which means much less than the wavelength, the distance to the end of my aperture, to my sample, is on the order of nanometers, and my, and my aperture is nanometers, I can do laser ablation, I can do LIBS down at those, those scales, okay? So this is a way of beating the diffraction limit. 
So the best we've been able to do using a femtosecond laser with a, an ENSOM, near field scanning optical microscope. So it's a commercial system. You basically can buy different fibers. It has all the piezoelectrics for telling you where you are with respect to your sample. We can actually make craters now. We can do laser ablation down to a diameter of about 27 nanometers and a depth of about 1.2 nanometers if we're using the 400 nanometer, 150 femtosecond pulse. And again, there's some wavelength dependence. So if we use 800 nanometers from our, our femtosecond laser, the crater size is a little bit bigger. So we can do laser ablation down at this level. However, we have not measured any traditional LIBS plasma, okay? We, you know, at this point, we've got about 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 9th, depending on what the density is. That's as many atoms as we've ablated. I don't even know if there's collisions that are causing light, okay? And if there is light, I'm not getting it out of the near field. So we had to go up. We know we can ablate. We can do sampling down at this uh, spatial size, but we can't see signal yet. So this is where we are. So we backed up. We went to a little bit bigger spot sizes, okay? And now we're just using the femtosecond laser in a very, very tight focusing configuration to where we can see signal. So we use this uh, muscovite sample, and we're looking at the sodium and potassium in this muscovite sample. And what this represents is just the spot size that we ablated. So this would be the surface, this would be the crater that the laser caused. And you can see the crater size in the sample. These are AFM images. And you can see the, uh, the, the atomic spectroscopy. So we're only using four nanojoules of energy from our laser. This, at, this at this spot, there's our spot size. It's on the order of about 450 nanometers, and we are seeing signal. So there's the potassium lines, there's the sodium line. So we're doing LIBS now, single laser shot, with a spatial resolution of 450 nanometers diameter. Okay, so here's the analytical chemistry. If you look at the, um, the sodium concentration in that sample, we basically ablated about 220 atograms of material and we're seeing a signal. Single laser shot, we're doing atogram detection limits. Okay, um, and that's assuming all of that sodium mass was excited to emission, which I know it's not. From all my experience, I think if you have about two or five percent uh, excitation, you're doing well. So um, this is pretty good. I haven't seen anybody come close to doing anything like this. This kind of spatial resolution is still getting a lib signal. Okay, next topic. No questions, nobody's thrown anything at me yet, so I guess you're either sleeping, lunch was really good. Rick, have you compared like, okay. the chemical composition you get with the femtosecond second laser pulse with a, a larger, uh, longer duration laser pulse? With so, a, yeah, so how accurate is that? Have I compared it to the, long, the nanosecond ablation? Yeah. It's, it's harder to get smaller spot sizes with the nanosecond ablation. It no, works. No, so, but say you have a bigger spot size, what's just the absolute chemistry? Is it, is it comparable? If you have a pure muscovite crystal, or, and you want to compare the femtosecond laser pulse with the nanosecond laser pulse. You mean in terms of accuracy? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are other questions in terms of sample heterogeneity and all that stuff. Oh. But can you, have you taken a pure, a pure substance? Nothing is pure at this level. Single crystal is probably pure, but at, at 400 nanometers, nothing is really other than single crystal. Muscovite is completely inhomogeneous. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't think but was was that the absolute concentration? We didn't we didn't do standards or anything like that. And again, the fact that I don't even know what the excitation efficiency is, and we're able to see a signal. But um, can you do any depth profiling, such as where the surface composition is different from the bulk composition, such as it has in OJ? Yeah, that so was the back in one of the. So what depths can you see differences, like one one nanometer? We can, uh, well, we, we can do one, well, here's the best we've been able to see a signal is 450 nanometers. No, wait, there's, there's different tricks we can play. We, ultimately, we need a certain amount of mass that's excited to emission to see it. So if we're very interested in, in, in nanometer spatial depth resolution, then what we do is we sacrifice our spot size. We go to a bigger spot size because we still need mass to give us, until we get sensitivity better, right? So we've opened up our beam to several hundred micron diameter, and then we can get several mic uh, nanometer 
depth resolution. 20? About 20 nanometers is the best we've done so far. How does that compare to OJ? I think OJ gets down to a nanometer type stuff. A couple nanometers? Even better than a couple. Well, they do better than this, but you have OJ where you're inside a vacuum chamber. You have electron beam bombardment. Right. About the same? No, OJ is better in terms of depth resolution. I think, like I said, the best we've been able to do so far is about 20 nanometer depth resolution. And OJ, Alex says, is on the order of a few. A few nanometers. But considering we don't do any sample preparation, we just hit it. That's it. Okay, so next topic, um, laser plasmas. Remember my question, can we do all this great stuff? So all along we've been looking at a particular transition. This is, this is a broadband spectra now. This is like I fired a laser shot, I generate this white light, the white light cools where it's, now you can spectrally resolve it. After a few microseconds, you'll see this picket fence across the entire UV visible IR of all these lines. And all these lines represent the elements that are in that sample, okay? So now what you can do is you can say, well, geez, that toy, those toxins, cancer, everything has its own chemical fingerprint. Just like a barcode has a physical representation of a product, a laser spectra is a, is a chemical representation of a product, right? I can start, well, we have started now storing library of spectra from everything we hit, right? Whether it's a cancer cell, whether it's an alloy, um, a, a nuclear device, a toxin, a toy. Basically, we start uh, accumulating spectra now into a database so that when somebody gives us an unknown, we feed it into that database, do principal component analysis, all kind of other chemometrics, and say, okay, what is, the, what is this sample that we don't know? And what's the probability that it's um, fuel oil versus uh, fertilizer versus an explosive? And that's the kind of thing that we can do now. So we take the entire spectra, we store it, okay? The, uh, the lines and the intensities represent the elements and their concentrations that are in these particular things. Excuse me, so this is compositional analysis, not any more than that. It's characterization or classification. It's not, at, at this point, I haven't figured out what's the best name for it. I can't a call it. Cell, a cancer cell and a healthy cell will give you the same. No, they won't. This is where we're working with some people. Well, I shouldn't say no, they won't. I, to the best of my understanding so far, uh, they won't. And this is a uh, National Institute of Health has a program called Metals in Medicine. And we're working with some people at Boston University now that are showing very strong correlations to metal accumulation in different cancer cells versus a normal cancer cell. That's as much as I know about it. Now it's up to the doctors to say, you know. So that's where we want to go with this, you know. And this, you know, will there be some very distinct signatures of a cancerous cell? And 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 I guess, right, because the, what, from what I understand, again, just talking to the Boston University doctors, is that different cancer cells will accumulate different metals, and that's perfect. We look, we see all the metals. It's a compositional characterization rather than a structural characterization. Yeah, yeah, strictly looking at a compositional characterization, right. But I, I don't know what to, I don't call this mass spec, molecular spectroscopy. It's really just a way of, um, <laughs> you know, establishing a spectral database of what different material, the chemical database of what these different materials look like. Here's an example for characterization of fuels. We went and we bought Valvoline, Chevron, Mobile, and Shell oil. Here's the spectrum across the entire UV visible IR. You see mostly carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, which you expect to see from a molecule. You'll see some impurities in there, depending on what, and additives, depending on what the, um, the particular uh, refinery is putting in the oil. But we were able to do, and I, somehow I left off the principal component analysis chart, we were able to discriminate one oil from another, what company it came from. So this is good for source attribution and forensics. We just pay, published a paper on conflict minerals. We can, uh, we can tell what mines different minerals come from. And actually, we just unfortunately had to do a field trip to Napa County to look at different, to collect different obsidian samples this weekend. So we're gonna start doing source attribution of uh, obsidian samples. I'm, I wouldn't be the first person to do wine if I told you we were doing wine. 
A lot of people are doing wine right now. Uh, <laughs> They tell whether or not wine comes from one region of the world or another. I mean, it's a different chemical signature. These are different alloys, and again, we call it counterfeit or forensic. We've done inks, we've done papers. Again, every spectra is a unique barcode. You can obviously see the difference between these different alloys. This was a 20 different solder samples. Uh, Lead-free solder versus um, solders with, uh, this is leaded solder versus unleaded solder, and then they had different, um, different uh, alloy elements in them. So again, you can classify things we're working with a, a, a group at Cairo University right now that's trying to look at uh, different bones from different eras of time and try to determine whether people um, came from that region or migrated to that region. So this is some work that we just started. And then um, I always like to show this one last. <laughs> and of course, most people, you guys recognize Pete's. Most people around the world don't know what I'm talking about when I say Pete's coffee. But what we need to do now is figure out what this means in terms of taste. But you can see, <laughs> it's obviously better. I'm not biased at all. Uh, but you can see that, again, the chemistry is so different. And this is a single laser pulse. In the error right here, the reason why this isn't a really tight group is because we didn't do any sample preparation at all. I hit a, I hit a bean with a laser, and that's it, and generated a spectra. And I generated about 20 spectra in each time. And I'm sure if I controlled the laser distance, the spot size, and I was really careful about where the beam was located under the laser beam, I could clean this up. But even here, just sticking beans under the laser beam, there you can see a very distinct difference between these different coffees. So, Okay, final one, and sorry if I'm going over. Um, just two more slides. We did um, the same concept out in the desert. We took a, a very big system. It had a 14-inch telescope. That, maybe that's not a big system to you guys. Put it on the back of a U-Haul. We had two lasers in it. And the goal was to see if we could do explosives at uh, 50 to 100 meters from the back of that U-Haul truck out at uh, Yuma Proving Grounds. So we made up a bunch of samples anywhere from all the military explosives. Uh, we had soil, desert soil, we had foliage, we had hamburger, we had cheese. Serious, we did, because cheese and hamburger look just like an explosive. They have carbon, ni oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. In them. Cheese, of course, has a lot of sodium. But again, we wanted to see, you know, if there's an explosive fingerprint, you want to make sure it's explosive and not some guy happen to just have a hamburger before you make a decision whether it's carrying explosives. So we were able to group the explosives. We had the most problem discriminating explosives from fuel oil. And people use fuel oil and fertilizer to make explosives. So it wasn't surprising that that's where we had the most trouble. We were able to discriminate everything else that should not be in the desert from the explosives and things like fuel oil and, and, um, and fertilizer. No problem, um, you know, see, if something was out of place in the desert, we, we could pick it up. And again, you probably know this and Jen, maybe this is what you talked about. Okay, and this is, again, the people at Los Alamos, JPL, and uh, Alex is working on a NASA SBIR at the company that LIBS pretty much will be on, on a couple of the, um, the Mars missions, but that gets the first one is ChemCam. Okay. So it's a pretty unique technique. So um, just finally, we spun off the company in 2004 called Applied Spectre. I'm still at Berkeley. Um, but we've had about a 30-year, three-decade, I'll get that right, uh, $50 million investment in research over the years, thanks to the Department of Energy very much. Uh, the company was started by SBIRs, and, and we had some congressional support. We already have three patents. We've established collaborations with a lot of different um, universities, national labs. We are manufacturing commercial instruments and actually have a, a LIBS and a laser ablation system that we do you know, commercially off the shelf. We have a, a, a LIB system. We have a femtosecond laser ablation system. This is a prototype, although the geologist that just came here to take us to Napa, this is a system that he's using. It's a little pelican case that can, you can wheel out into the field, stick a sample in there and get a spectrum. And we actually made a little handheld prototype, but that's not a commercial product yet. These are the only commercial products. So anyway, just uh, for summary, laser plasma spectro spectrochemistry, same technology offers elemental, molecular, and isotopic analysis, which is, I think, pretty impressive considering other analytical sources. No sample preparation. 
just hit it with a laser beam. We can do every element on a periodic chart. So we can do the light elements, no problem, carbon, lithium, hydrogen, um, a lot of the things that uh, XRF cannot do. Uh, we can do contact to stand off and again summarize with, you know, this is kind of a dis disruptive technology. It's going to open up a lot of applications that, you know, we really don't know what they will be yet. So I went on for a long time. Nobody threw anything at me, so I guess that means you were either sleeping or you liked it. So, <laughs> so thanks. Um, Rick, could I start off the questions? Um, uh, with the uh, LIBS instrument going to Mars, what, can you give some insights into what you think will be the, the greatest challenges that they'll face in the Martian environment uh, <laughs> using LIBS? Maybe I'll leave that for Jen and Alex. I mean, they're doing a lot, I think. So if they, in a lower pressure environment, um, uh, they're going to be uh, in a, that's going to benefit the results. It, it, it will. It's in an interesting way that, that works in their favor. I don't know exactly what the what the pressure is and what the what the atmosphere is, but I think Los Alamos, I know, has built several chambers where they're actually testing a lot of the different materials that they expect to find. Ultimately, it comes down to having some idea of what your samples are going to be, what elements you're looking for. Alex or Jim? Is, Martian atmosphere, uh, the pressure at the surface of Mars is actually most advantageous for LIPS because uh, our atmosphere on Earth is thick, so the plasma is small. Once you reduce pressure a little bit, like uh, you're going to Mars, the pr plasma becomes bigger because it's not that much constrained by atmosphere and it's easy to look at it. Yeah, But if you go uh, on a total vacuum, like on the moon, the, the plasma disappears so fast that you can't see it. So at Mars, it's the best, uh, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, and I and I agree. I think that the, the but to answer Adrian's question, the real challenge will be again the analytical chemistry. I don't know if you agree with that, but I don't know how how much they really understand about the soils already to know what kind of chemical interferences they might be up against. That would be the thing that I would question. Um, I had a, I had a question about. Um, uh, home use of these things. Do you envision a commercial thing that you could buy, say, at Fry's, uh, to test your fruits and vegetables for p uh, pesticides? Yeah, all kinds of things like that. Um, <laughs> you, yeah, I, I can envision that, but um, what I've learned in my seven years of being in business versus being at Berkeley, where the government you know, funds a proposal, um, we would first have to convince uh, a market or a, like a venture capital or someone that this is an important application to address and they're willing to fund it. Um, the product development is a lot different than doing the research in the lab. So w yes, we can do it. We can make the sensor tailored to pesticides on fruits. You can, you can do it to toys. You could, you could have the same sensor that could look at different things in the household products. So, Well, we've done that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep picking on you every time. Um, I'm not supposed to say that, but uh, we, actually one project we had is um, for the Air Force where we were looking at residues of people who had fi fired rockets, shoulder propelled rockets, and you could see trace residues of gunshot all over their clothing. Um, we've done hair analysis. Obviously you can tell where somebody has been by the, the elements in their hair. Um, and I have let it hit my skin time to time just to show people that it's not as bad as it looks. So going back to Mars here for a second, uh, in order to do the isotopic analysis, you were relying on the oxidation of the plasma, but Mars has very little atmosphere and certainly very little oxygen. Um, is the oxygen that is, comes out of the rocks sufficient to oxidize the other elements that are in the rocks, or are you relying on an Earth-like atmosphere for the oxidation? I mean, that's, that's an excellent question. These, these are all new studies, and one of the things that we, we want to look at is um, you don't need much oxygen to form an oxide, and if you have a stoichiometric oxide in your sample, it's, we think, and until we do these studies in a vacuum, or we can't, can't go completely vacuum, because like Alex was saying, the plasma expands so quickly you don't even have collisions or light. So we think that um, 
there could be enough oxygen in the material, and especially in an oxide. I don't know about the soil composition on Mars to know how much oxygen is in the soil. But um, are there other species in there that would form? A lot of oxygen in the soil? Oh, if you got CO2, then same thing, yeah. I mean, these, these atoms are so hot and ions coming off that they collide with any gas at all. It rips the gas apart. And if there's oxygen there, the first thing that's going to form just um, on binding strengths and things like that is, is the oxide. But one of the studies we wanted to do is go to lower and lower pressures to see if there's enough oxygen in the sample itself to give you these spectra. So, now, now again, this, this isotope signatures is not something that ChemCam has even I don't even think knows about yet. We just published our first paper maybe two months ago. Yeah. Uh, maybe I missed the answer to this question, so forgive me. But okay. it would seem to me that you would need a different um, laser frequency for each sample. Have you shown that um, for, say, different alloys, um, you get different answers if you change the frequency of the, of the laser? It's not so dependent on that. Um, but it is. A, it should be a little bit. A little bit. Because of heat capacity differences? Well, that would be pul pulse duration, the optical penetration depth does affect you, but at the peak powers we're working at, most of the processes are multi-photon nonlinear processes. So single photon absorption processes, mechanisms, models don't even come close to telling us how much mass we're going to move and what the heat affected zone is. And we're working at peak powers on the order of 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12th with the femtosecond, 10 to the 15th watts per centimeter so square. It overrides everything. And it overrides okay. all of our linear thermal dynamic understanding. And that's why we spent 30 years, three decades studying this. I'm going to pick on you forever about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we spent 30 years trying to, trying to uh, uh, come up with the right mechanisms to predict the, the, the explosion process. But, um, some people have done work where they've, they've, they've used a laser frequency tuned to like pure silicon or pure copper. They know what the atomic transitions are. And they, they will see some enhancement in the, in the emission spectra because there is some like fluorescence type of mechanism going on. But overall, we hit it with, we hit it with a hammer. <laughs> uh, will you be able to, uh, I see defense threat, fly over other countries and detect um, nuclear devices and can you fly over a marijuana area and pick out fields? Well there you just kind of breathe hard, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, do I look like I came from the 60s? <laughs> uh, uh, all my friends when I told them I was giving a talk at SETI, they go, Russo, you really made it in your career. So anyway, um, I am funded by the Department of Energy to do what you asked, to see if we could fly over um, an institution and shine a laser beam at it. The big problem is, I mean, we know we can do, we can do uranium, we can do plutonium, we know we can do, we can tell if somebody is doing something they shouldn't be doing. That's not a problem if we have a sample. And we can collect samples, uh, covertly, overtly, however. But the goal would be to fly over and be able to do it. So the big problem with laser beams is aperture. So if I'm at several tens of thousands of feet, I can get my laser beam to the target. But seeing that, and this is something, you know, you guys look at stars or, again, way outside what the astronomy does is, I can't see that little tiny plasma that I generate from my, my craft. So that's the challenge right now, is to be able to see the signal. I can generate a spark. We were out in the desert, we were generating sparks, again, depending on how much laser power, how much aperture, we could gen generate sparks out to about 130 meters. And that was strictly because of the aperture that we went out there with. And we could see it. And I know we could generate spark even further, but the further we got, we just didn't have the collection optics in order to see the little tiny plasma. This plasma only lost on the order of microseconds, so we can't even sit there and integrate. Now we could fire a lot of pulses and then integrate the light from a bunch of pulses, but our goal has always been to do single shot analysis, especially if we have a residue. If you have a fingerprint on a car door, you only get one shot and you completely you know, remove that residue. But yeah, if I'm looking down there at a, a nuclear plant and I'm able to hit the material I want to look at, maybe I could do a few laser shots. So, it is a goal. 
You know, with the ability to uh, determine different ratios of an isotope, is this something that maybe could be an alternative to radiocarbon dating or something like that? I would hope so. I don't know enough about them. I haven't spent much, most of my career, only the last year of my career have I started looking at the, the importance of isotopes. We've always emphasized the elements, elemental analysis. I'm just learning about the isotope dating. I don't know if we can get the precisions that the people use with the mass specs. You know, this is all pretty new, but if we can do radio dating. I know the, um, the people are very interested in the strontium. And again, I don't know enough about the different isotopes. So strontium and rubidium uh, radiogenic uh, age dating, that might be possible. But carbon will require much more precision that probably will not be available with the simple technique. I always love when he says probably will not. That's always a challenge to me <laughs> to prove him wrong. <laughs> But, no, it's a challenge, and, and we, we've talked about this in other ways we can probe this plasma. Uh, the people have looked at absorption spectroscopy and laser plasmas as a way of doing much higher precision and sensitivity. So maybe not the emission itself, but maybe coupling two lasers together, maybe we can do the carbon. Would you agree with that, or? You don't know. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> Okay, if uh, you have any more questions, then I'd encourage you to come and speak to Rick after. And uh, Rick, uh, as a memento of your talk, we have another oh, test you. target here for you. No, uh, no, no, I'm going to cherish this. <laughs> hopefully you'll find some alien material in there or something, and please get back to us if you do. <laughs> okay. uh, we'll do, it's a deal. <laughs> please join me in thanking Rick for his great stuff. Thank you.